Thanks for being back with us tonight. I want to enter into another study with you. And this study comes from the book of Proverbs. It's the first four verses of chapter 16. I'm going to call this lesson and this study the idea of man's plans but God's purposes. Man has plans. We all make plans. But what are God's purposes? There's a certain wide gap of a difference between those two things. What man is trying to plan and do and think about in life and what God's purpose is. Now look, there's, there is some nature to this lesson that's a little bit, I guess, you know, just more uh, looking at a general point of view in life. But I believe it's highly practical. And, and it's practical not in the standpoint of it involves this particular sin or that particular act of righteousness, but it's how you think about your life and what you do. And, and all of us at different points in our life are planning. We are making plans. We're thinking about things that we want to accomplish and do. And what do you think about that? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, let, let's read those four verses we're going to be studying from tonight. You might open your Bible to follow along with, but here they are. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Commit your works to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its own, for his, for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. All right, we'll probably just take it verse by verse and be looking at this this, this evening. Man's plans. The first verse said this, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. We look at plans in this life. Young people have plans as they're forming up. We have temporary plans sometimes, but I'm talking about long-term plans. Young people are usually thinking at this stage of life, you know, about uh, where they could go to college, what kind of career they're going to have, are they going to get married or not married, and sometimes all these plans we make don't even turn out to be the way we envision them to, but it's not wrong to have a plan. And I, I kind of want to start right there. If you read that language, the plans of the heart belong to man. That's perfectly fitting within our ability and what God allows. God says you may plan anything you want to. You may look ahead and say, I want to try to achieve this, or I want to be here in X number of years. I want my future to go like this. You can make plans, and by plans we're talking about the preparations you make for the future, the things that you want to see arranged in your life. Now like in Proverbs chapter 21, it talks about there at verse 5, that the plans of the diligent lead to abundance. What is that saying? It's saying if you combine two things, a good plan and diligence and work and all of that, then you're going to receive abundance as a result of that. But when you approach everything in life, if you're too hasty, if you don't plan out or whatever, that can lead to poverty. So he's really saying it's good to have a plan it's good to make preparation. It's good to think about the future and where you're going to be and what you're going to try to achieve. There's not anything wrong with that. But the second part of that verse clarifies something. Everybody's got the right to make a plan. Everybody's got a right to look down in the future and say, this is where I'd like to be and this is where I'd like to, what I'd like to accomplish. And you can do that, but he reminds us of this. He said the answer of the tongue is from God. And that contrast may not quite strike you. You may be saying, well, I, I don't, that, that's meant to be a contrast, but I don't understand the contrast. A man is out here planning, but the answer of the tongue is from God. He's not saying, or I don't believe that he's saying, that your plans, you know, that, that you can make those, but it's going to be how you talk that matters. But that's not really what this context is about. The context is talking about your plans, your preparations for the future and how you think about that. I believe a proper interpretation here is that the last word, the answer that God will give, while you plan, God's the one that's going to have the last word. God's going to have the answer to what's going 
to go forward in your life. You can plan, but God, I believe would be a proper way to put it, has the final answer on that. The mind, verse 9, talks about the mind of a man plays, plans his way. But the Lord is involved in directing our steps. That is, the Lord orders where we go and how we go. The Lord orders things that will happen to us in the future. The Lord sees about things that will come to pass and, and has a part in some of that. So we can plan all we want to, but it's the Lord ultimately that decides and says whether our plans will succeed or where they not. This is a bitter dose for a lot of people that think, oh, I'll just plan out my life and I'll say it'll be this way and it'll be this way. Can I tell you something? A lot of, a lot of young men when they were 19 were thinking, you know, in 10 years I'm going to be the head of a company and I'm going to be flying around on a jet plane and I'm, you know, going to be having all these things and they're changing diapers and doing that today. You know, they didn't envision this is how life plays out. They thought in terms it'll go this way or whatever. It doesn't always go the way we expected it to. Well, which, by the way, is not a bad thing. Sometimes our expectations were a little ridiculous. But the, the fact is simply that the Lord has a say in what's going to happen in your life, and that's something we have to accept. That, that was nowhere better brought home than in, in the book of James. And in the book of James, chapter 4, it's verse 13 and 16. He taught us this. And you know, James has some nuggets of truth that remind you a lot of the Proverbs. But here's what he says. Come now, you who say that today or tomorrow we're going to go into such and such a town, we're going to spend a year there, we're going to trade, and that we're going to make a profit. What's wrong with planning that? What's wrong with saying that's what we're expecting to do? Well, really, there's nothing wrong with it. There's not anything wrong with saying this is what we would like to do. This is what we're planning to accomplish. But what James brings up here is the one thing you don't know is what tomorrow brings. Not just literally tomorrow as in Monday morning, but what the future brings. That's something, and we all know this, but that's something we don't know. So sometimes when we say, I'm going to do this, we're really making a mistake. You don't know what tomorrow brings. And at worst, it may bring the end of your life. He brings out the fact, what is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So he, he pictures even the ultimate things we might face. We might say, well, I'm going to do it. But all of that will be contingent upon the question of, number one, will you live to see that tomorrow? And nobody knows that. But even beyond that, let's say you live. How do you know that you'll get to do that? How do you know that you'll get to go to such and such city? How do you know that you'll get to trade there? How do you know that you'll make a profit? You don't know any of those things. And so he says, James says, that instead of making plans for the future and saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, it's going to be accomplished, you should add a phrase to your vocabulary, and that is when you make a plan, you should put this with it, whether in your mind or in your mouth, you should be saying, if the Lord wills, I shall go and do such and such. Why do you need to do that? Because that's a realistic acknowledgement. You don't know anything beyond that. If the Lord wills, if the Lord chooses, we will live and we will do this or that. But he says, if you say that I'm going to do it, I've got it, I'm going ahead, I will accomplish this. If you think your plan is ironclad, well, James just says, you've got an arrogance problem because you don't know what the future holds. You don't know your tomorrows. So God is not against you planning, but God wants you to remember something that it all is contingent on that phrase, if the Lord wills. And it's good for us to remember that, and it's good for us not to be arrogant, but to keep in our, our hearts that all of this is dependent on the Lord. And I, I will say to you this evening, we kind of have gotten in a stage in our lives, I'm talking about a stage in our history, 
where I don't think we think anywhere near enough about that. Matter of fact, I think there's a lot of people think, oh no, it's just pretty well up to you. <clears throat> Whatever you do, you know, if you're successful enough and talented enough, you're going to go out there and get it. Most graduation speeches tell all the things you could accomplish and do once you get out in the world, and all of that's fine, but nobody talks about, yeah, if the Lord wills, you shall do this or that. And I think we all ought to get that in our hearts because the plans a man makes, according to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 1, that's all well and good. The heart of man can plan all it wants to. But the Lord has the final say. The Lord has the final answer on whether you will get to do this or that. He's that involved in your life. And that's what I want you to know, understand, and see. Now, with that thought in mind, let, let me add a just kind of where the lesson goes from here. That passage, to me, lays the groundwork for the next three verses that we're going to study and sets up three things that I think are principles you need to stop and consider tonight that are important to all plans. Now, can I say just something quick? In every one, I believe it's in every one of these verses. Do you see the word Lord up there? Obviously you do. <clears throat> Can you tell me, and just, you don't have to answer out loud, but raise your hand, if you know why they capitalized every letter in it. Okay, two or three. <clears throat> okay, that's because in a lot of scripture, how they do things is, when it's not really the word Lord, it's the word Jehovah. When they want you to know it's the word Jehovah or Yahweh or however you want to call it, Jehovah God, they do all capitals in the Lord. But when you see it all capitalized like that, then understand in your Bible, he's talking about Jehovah, the name of God that's given to Moses and given to the children of Israel. And the reason I brought that up is because that's the Lord, that's Jehovah, that's the powerful almighty God, that is the one that created the heavens and the earth. That is the Lord that did all things. That is the Lord that created you. That's the Lord that makes the weather. That's the Lord that does all of these wondrous things and has brought about changes in history because of his power. That's the Lord, and so that same Jehovah that created the heavens and the earth, the, the Jehovah that can set the stars in motion up there is the Lord that has something to do with the plans of your life. How will your life go? I guess what I'm saying is it's a tiny bit arrogant to say, I have planned and this will be accomplished, when in reality, the creator, owner, and instigator of all things in this universe, our Jehovah Lord God, says, well, you can plan all you want to, but I will decide what's going to happen. You have to see his power in all of that. And, you know, I don't want you to feel insignificant because you're important to him, but you also have to understand it's kind of silly for me to say, well, I have planned this, but what if Jehovah God looks at it and says, well, I have planned for you not to do that. That does not fit what I think you should be doing. What if he sees that? And how arrogant we would be to challenge him on that matter. So you have to think from that standpoint. Okay, well, with that in mind, here are some of the things we're going to look at. Now, I think each of these next three things are going to kind of reflect again on our plans. And God's going to talk about, well, I want to know when you plan, I want to know your motives. I want to know why you want that. Why are you planning to do that? It will have something to do with whether or not God lets you accomplish that. Secondly, your trust in God. Are you willing to turn this over to God and say, now I'm putting my ideas and my plans in your hand for you to decide, God, whether this is appropriate or not, good or not. I'm putting my life in your hands, and I'm trusting you for the right answer. So that I would be saying to God, I have a plan, I want to accomplish this, this is what I'd like to see my life go, but I also know that you're a lot smarter than me, God, and so what do you think about these plans? 
you're putting it into His hands. Okay, we'll talk about that in a moment. And then another thing we see is that we all have to realize something, and, and you can plan and it's fine, but God has purposes. And I want you, everybody, to know, down to the youngest child to the oldest person in this audience, God has a purpose for you. God has purposes He wants us, as especially His people, to fulfill. He has reasons why we should be what we'd be. And we need to think about that because what if my plan contradicts God's purpose? What if God says, this is what you need, this is what you need to be, this is where I need to take you, this is the life I need to get you into, this is where I want you to go. What if God's purpose conflicts with my plan? What do you think? Knowing God, what do you think is going to happen to my plan then? then I'm going to have to trust that God's smarter than me and God has His purposes too. And so we need to look at that and and expound on that a little bit more. So our planning always ought to bear in mind those three things. And again, not wrong to plan, but we want to walk in God's will. We need to make sure we're coordinating with Him. Okay, let's start with that about our motives. Your motives, okay? Proverbs 16 verse 2. Going to give you a fact about you and me. And he's going to say, all the ways, <clears throat> all the ways of man. In other words, everything I choose to do, everything I plan, everything I want to do. And that's so encumbersome, it, it, it applies to Larry, it applies to Pat, it applies to Carol, it applies to all you ladies, it goes across the board. Every plan that we make, we're going to believe something about it. This is a good plan, and I mean it sincerely. Every last one of us, if we have a plan, if we think, and I want this to wind up this way, you will believe you're right. You will be clean in your own eyes, he calls it. As far as you're concerned, you will be pure and wholesome, and you will mean it for the best. And that all sounds real good, and then he says, but the Lord's going to be looking at your motives. You will believe that you're absolutely on the right track and God will believe, possibly, maybe that you are or maybe that, no, this isn't going to work at all. You have to understand we don't see ourselves always the right way. In fact, in its own estimation and final standards of evaluation, the simple truth is, when we evaluate and estimate our own motives, we think we're innocent and pure, and the simple fact is, very often, we are not at all pure in, our, in God's sight. None of us knows ourselves very well in this matter. We think we want to do something. Let me give you an illustration, a couple of them. I've experienced this with young men before. They say, well, I want to preach the gospel. Okay, we get them set up to preach the gospel, train them, send them out. Three or four years later, they're not preaching the gospel. They've gone back to a secular job, and that's, you know, if that's their business, they can go do that. But, but here's the thing, here's what I've heard some of them say. Well, uh, you know, if I can go back to school and get a job and get a job in the secular field, you know, I'll be able to go anywhere I need to to preach the gospel. That may absolutely be true. It's the Lord's business of whether or not their motives are true, but what I'm saying is that can be absolutely phony and a fib. The real reason may be I don't want to have to live on that wage. I want to live. I want to make whatever money I want to make. Or I don't want to have to depend on the church to do all that. I'd rather have my own money coming in, and then maybe I'll do that. And I've seen several young men that they never started preaching after that. They just went on with their secular job. And, and that's okay. I and mean, God didn't say you have to preach. You not be a preacher, I mean. God didn't lay down the law that says everybody's got to do that. But sometimes in our motives we think that, Somebody else may come along and say, well, I want to be an elder so I can serve the Lord. Good. But God may look at their motives and they may want to be an elder so they can say, 
who can do what in the church or wh where the church is going. And, and, and let's, in other words, it's kind of a power game. Motive is a tough thing, and believe you me, I've had to question myself at times about my motives in preaching the gospel. You can get the wrong motives. You can want to do it just to please people. You can want to do it to get compliments. You can want to do it to, to uh, you know, have sway over people. That can be a hundred reasons why somebody might want to do this. But the reality is you have to be careful about that. And even, you know, I've seen people, even when it was pretty obvious that they had bad motives, they didn't know they had bad motives. They are too, it's too hard to read. The heart is a deceitful thing sometimes, and we have to be careful about that. Also in the book of James, he talks about motives. And he kind of talks about them in connection with prayer, and he said, okay, one of their problems, he said, you want things, and you don't have them because you haven't even bothered to ask God. But then he goes to a second category and he said, but then again, some of you have asked. In other words, you, you, don't, you don't have because you don't ask, but then here's somebody else who said, when you ask, you didn't receive. And you got mad at God. You asked God to help you do something. You asked God to bless you with something. You asked God to take away this uh, trouble you're facing. You asked God for this and that. And you didn't receive. And you want to blame God for that, or you may even get a little angry at God or bitter with God because He didn't answer your prayer, and the Bible says God answers prayer. But He said, you know what? What, for instance, in this context, He's saying, what if you ask God for greater resources, and in your mind you're thinking, yeah, I could give more, and I could do this for people and that for people. <clears throat> but what if your real motive was to spend it on your own selfish purposes? And he said, sometimes people don't see that. They don't see that in their hearts that's really the problem right there. And so he says, when God looks down and sees that, do you think God will answer your prayer? Do you think God's going to say, yeah, I'll bless you with that when he sees that your motives are altogether wrong? Do you think God will bless a situation where, like in the church, where somebody wants a place or a position, but they just want it, for the prominence of it and, and, you know, to get attention or whatever, do you think God would be happy with that? God's not going to go with that. He's not going to accept that kind of situation. Sometimes, even when people think their motives are good, we've got to remember, even if it seems like a good motive, we have to stop and kind of take a step back and remember it's still God that judges all of that. And the Lord... He's got the facts that we don't have and he's got the ability to see in the hearts and he has the ability to judge with absolute purity. And so he could look into our plans. And so when you say, well, I, I'm making plans and I'm making these plans so that I can uh, you know, accomplish things in my life and I want to be a productive person, I want to work and that may all be good. But God could see your heart, and he may see other things there that you're not acknowledging. And I'll tell you about that. When it says that God looks at your heart, God looks at your motives, to me, that, that's kind of a two-edged sword. One half of it is a warning. It's a warning to all of us about your motives. Be careful why you're doing this, or you're doing it for a good and righteous reason. And another side to that is it may be comforting because... Sometimes our motives are pure. Sometimes we meant well when we did something. Somebody criticized us. But it's sort of good to know that God would look at my heart and say, Look, you know, you, mis you misread them. Their motives were pure. They wanted to do the right thing. And you shouldn't judge them for that. So we need to be careful about the matter of motives. All right, here's another thing. What are you willing to trust God with? So when you're planning... Try as best you can with that part of us that's pretty confusing sometimes. Take a good look at your motives. Now the second thing we're going to look at is your willingness to trust. Your willingness to commit. Commit to Christ. Commit to God. Look at verse 3. Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. Now that sounded pretty certain, didn't it? Commit your works to the Lord 
and then your plans will be established. Let's talk about that word commit for a moment. It's an interesting word. Uh, it, it comes from a word that means to roll. <laughs> what on earth does that have to do with anything? Roll it. Roll it. Well, in this, in this case, the, the idea is like turn it over, roll it over out of your hands into God's hands. That's what he means by commit. Put it in God's hands. Take it out of your control and put it into God's hands for His management, for His answers, for His wisdom. Are you willing to do that with your plans in life, what you want to accomplish, what you want to take place? Are you willing to say, I'm turning this over to God, I've done the best I can, this is what I'd like to do, but then again, I know God has greater wisdom than I have. And I think, of course, first thing when you talk about committing that to God, you should go to God in prayer and you should ask Him, lay these plans out before God and say, this is what we'd like to accomplish. This is what I'd like to see take place. There's nothing wrong with that. and that, That's an appropriate thing for you to do. You recognize a couple of things right away. Number one, it'd be pretty hard to go before God and say, I'd like to, I'd like to roll this little plan over to you, Lord and commit it into your hand. I'd like to do something that really violates your word and is highly sinful. Well, right, right away, you, know, you could pretty well know. Well, that's, that's not going to work with God. He's not going to like that at all. And so you kind of automatically get that feeling, oh, well, I can't do that. We'd probably more likely just never pray about it or say anything about it. I, I can't commit, ask God to commit or commit myself over in a plan that's a sinful plan. And... Frankly, I can't commit that to God at the same time saying, but I'm going to kind of ignore God's wisdom on this issue. I don't feel like I can commit to God a plan that basically says, you know, God, really and truly, I won't be able to serve you very well. For instance, uh, here's a job that I'd like to take and here's, a, here's something I'd like to do and I just want to commit that into your hands. Now, the job's going to require me to work 60 hours a week and it's all going to be on Sundays and I'll work at nights. There'll probably be no Wednesday nights. And, you know, I'd really like to get this job so I can make more money and have more for my family and all of that. But do you think God wants to cooperate with that plan? If He knows you're pretty much the future is, leave God out of the picture. I think you have to say if it's going to ignore God, it's not really much of a plan to start with for the future of the life of somebody who claims to want a relationship with God. When we think about all of this, the key to this statement up here again now, commit your works to the Lord so that your plans can be established. The key is, are you going to look at God's ideas? As you make your plan, are you going to talk about God in that picture? Are you going to take into consideration what God wants of you? I, I think you could say the same thing. Let's just take it on a different level. Let's say I've got this job and it's going to, you know, I'm going to be gone all the time. I'm probably never going to hardly be home. I've got three kids sitting there at home and, uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to be there for them, raise them, teach them God's Word or anything. But boy, I really want to do this. Is that a real plan? Is that any kind of plan that God's going to be happy with? We have to think about it. You have to respect God in these purposes for God to help you establish your plan. When he mentions works, commit your works to the Lord. Works in this particular case means, it means your deeds, but it means the work that you do, the acts that you take on and, and do, the, the business that you engage in, even the workmanship that you wish to become. So God's already told you that you can plan, but that he's going to have the final say about these things. And to succeed, you're going to have to think about those goals in the right way, and you're going to have to think about, well, what does God want here? Is that going to be aligned with what God would want me to accomplish in my life? And like here in Ephesians chapter 2, here's one of the things that God says about what he wants from us. He wants us to be his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God 
prepared all these good works beforehand, before we ever came along. God had decided what kind of people we need to be so that we would walk in these works and live this way and act this way. And I'm just saying to you tonight, anything that conflicts with that, to me, is going to be a problem for us in God's sight. How is God going to be happy with the person that says, well, I won't have time for any of that. I won't be any of that, but I would like God to endorse my plan. That just doesn't work. You're going to have to think about God in your plans. You're going to have to say if the Lord wills, and you're going to have to think about, does this even fit the kind of person God wants me to do, be? But he says if you're willing to take God into consideration in all of this and what God wants and what God thinks about things and what God is planning for your life, then there is a hope of your plans being established and God will help you accomplish these things. Matter of fact, even that rude idea of of the words there suggests the idea that this is pretty certain that this will come to pass. So God's telling us we're going to have to respect the fact that He's in charge. You're going to have to respect His wisdom on the subject. You're going to have to accept all of these things in order for us to come along and, and see all of this come to pass. I want you to think about something. This illustrates what I'm talking about. And it illustrates it in a way I hope we'll all understand. This is Solomon talking, and he's talking about the building of the temple. And here's what he said, and it fits all we know about David and what he was planning. Now, it was in the heart of my father to build a house for the name of the Lord. And we all remember that David had a plan. David got to thinking about the status of the tabernacle. And it bothered him that the tabernacle, probably very much aged by that time, seemed to be kind of shabby and a tent. And he, he, it bothered David to think about that I live in a palace, in a fine home, and the things of God are over here in a raggedy tent. And so David had a plan, and David's plan was, I want to ask God if I can build him a house. And so David took it to the prophet. David didn't just start building, he took it to the prophet, and the prophet came back to him and he said, well, you can do what's in your heart. And so Solomon, remembering all of this, says, you know, it was back there in the heart. That's a plan. It was in the heart of my father David to build a house. Now, the first thing I want you to see about it is when David wanted to build God a house, this is an acceptable plan, okay? The Lord said, it's in your heart for you to do it, and you did well. I'll get back to that in a minute. It's good that that was in your heart. God complimented David and said that that was a good plan. And we know that the plan came to pass, but here's the deal. God looked at David and and he he saw a man. What is David doing? Is this David saying, you know, Lord, I've been looking at things. And uh, I've learned how to do a lot of things, but one of the things I'd really like to do, I'd like to build you a house because I would like everybody in the country to know that we Israelites are smart and we can build things and it can be beautiful and it'll be the prettiest thing in the world. You think if David had come to God and said, that's what I want, or God had even looked at David's heart and saw, that's what he wants, he wants something, a showpiece, in other words. You think God would have looked at that and said, I like that. I think God would have turned him down. Matter of fact, even when David did say all of this, God said, I never asked for any of that. But here's the simple truth. David didn't talk anything or feel anything about a show place or doing something for for all of this so David could brag to people and say, see how smart we are. What did David say? He said, I want to build this for God's name. I want God to be recognized, glorified, and appreciated by this building. That's my goal. And I believe David meant that because this verse says God looked in his heart and God could see that that's exactly what David wanted to do. So that's that part of it. So you got David's 
you know, his desire. It's not David's achievement. He's doing it for God. And God says to him that what was in David's heart, he said, you did well that that was in your heart. So God, God said there's an alignment here. This hasn't happened before. This hasn't been built before. But David has made a plan, and that plan connects with something that God sees as an appropriate thing, and that is it's being done to the, promote the name of the Lord. And when God's plan and God's purposes fit David's plan and David's purposes, all of a sudden God says, we're going to do this. But then he threw David a curveball. And he said to David, you've planned it. You said you wanted to do it. I'm going to let it be done, and you're not going to do it. I'll give it into the hands of your son. God had his reasons for that. What do you think about that? What, you know, what if it was your big plan? You want to accomplish this. You want to see this done. And God says, you know what? I really like that idea. I think we're going to go with that, except for one thing. You're never going to get to do it. One of your kids can do it. David, all you can do is help him get ready. But you'll never get the glory of any of this. You know, you, you have to stop with that, that, that God tinkered with David's plan. David's plan was, build it. God's purpose and plan was, but not David. David, you've done really well proposing this, but you're not going to be the one to do it. Sometimes, what if God throws your plan like that? What if he says... Oh yeah, that's a good, um, obviously he's not going to literally say this, but what, you know, Father, if in the coming to pass, you don't ever get to do that, but one of your children do. Do you think God respected your plan? Absolutely he respected your plan. He just said it's not going to be done by you, but the person you've taught and helped, they're going to do it for me. We have to be prepared for that I'm talking about, and it just shows you that you can plan but the Lord will decide these kind of details of how it's all going to go down. And that's why we have verses in the Bible that says, now you've got to commit your way to the Lord, and you've got to trust also in Him that He's going to help you do this. You're going to have to depend upon Him and His wisdom and His ways, and God may tinker with your plan, but He'll accomplish what you wanted out of this. He'll get done the heart of what's needing to be done with his wisdom involved. Trust in the Lord, Proverbs 3 says. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And you've got to catch this in it all because think about what we've been going with here. He says, don't get caught up in your understanding. It's the worst thing you can do. Yeah, but that was my plan. Don't lean on your understanding. Instead, acknowledge God and let him help direct those paths and do things with respect to his wisdom. Well, let's get to verse 4. God's purposes. And when you're looking at God's purposes, it says the Lord made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. You remember Pharaoh. Pharaoh came along, and Pharaoh was out there, and Pharaoh had this power. And, you know, why did God put Pharaoh on the throne. Some of you may be, may be thinking, well, God didn't put him on the throne. He was just on the throne. And the reality is, but no, God had a purpose for Pharaoh. In fact, in Romans 9, 17, it says, the scripture said to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. You're not Pharaoh because you were smart. You're not Pharaoh because you wanted to be Pharaoh. You're Pharaoh. I raised you up, God says, because I wanted kind of a worthy opponent out there when I did these signs and wonders in Egypt. That's why you're Pharaoh. <laughs> kind of takes the wind out of you, doesn't it? That's why you're Pharaoh, not because you're smart, but it shows that God could, could even prepare Pharaoh for God's own purposes. Even the wicked, it says in this verse, which is hard to take as we study it, but the simple fact is that the fact that we have wicked people in this world makes that sharp contrast to let us shine our lights in the midst of darkness. Because there are wicked people in this world, it tests me. Instead of me just playing it easy all the way through life, I have to be tested by wicked people who show 
an obstacle to my righteousness and try to prevent me from doing what's right. So in other words, even though it's a horrible thing that there are wicked people, it provides a test for me to see if I'm really sincere about serving God. Because there are wicked people, there are examples all around every day of their lives to show us that is an example of what not to do and how not to live. And they're going to show one day that God is the supreme judge of all the earth because God will judge them and hold them accountable. And we have to remember that. You know, there are passages that talk about God's might and God's power and how God creates things. And he says, in Romans chapter 9, he says, Does not the potter have the same right? The right to make out of one same lump of clay. Some pottery makes it for special purposes and some for common use. Can't the potter do pretty much what he wants to about that? The potter can choose. The potter decides. And how you can be, when something God makes, you can be a vessel of honor or you can be a vessel of dishonor. But to be a vessel of honor is the thing to choose, to want to be. And that's called, that takes place because we yield to God. We have to do all of this in submission to God because we have to say, look, you have to think like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. You can cry and you can moan and you can worry and you can do everything else in the world, but in the end you've got to be able to look God in the face and say, not my will but thine be done. You've got to be able to say, look, your purposes are more important than my plans in this life. Proverbs 19 verse 23 says, 21 says, many or the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that's going to stand. His purposes are far more important than your plans. Well, my time is up, and I, I wanted to make you five, and I'd like to rush through these, and I just won't read them, but here's the deal. Here's some things that we need to see. God wants you to bring glory to His name. He wants you to walk righteously and shine in this world. He wants you to use the talents and gifts that He's given you for Him to, to accomplish good. He wants us especially, I believe, to be the fathers, mothers, husbands, wives, sons, daughters, employers, employees, so on and so forth, that He has designed and given according to His will. God wants all of that. And the plans of our hearts ought to be directed towards that end. All right, I'm going to stop right there. It's 10 till and I have five points. I don't think I'll ever make it. So I'll, I better quit. All right, take away from this lesson. You've got plans. You want to do things. You'll have these all through your life. You'll look ahead. Even when you get to my age, you'll be looking and say, oh, you know, I'm trying to plan for this or that. You'll be doing all of that, and that's appropriate. And God says you're not wrong to do that. But please take into great consideration that God affects all kinds of plans. And that don't get caught up in this business of thinking, well, it's a sure thing because I've done it this way or that way. God can decide different courses that we're going to follow. And if we'll listen to God and His wisdom, sometime He will take us where we needed to go or into situations we needed to be in that are better for us spiritually than we would have ever chosen for ourselves. You just have to trust Him in that regard. Commit it. Roll it over to Him. Don't be distressed if it doesn't go your way because God has His own purposes for what he wants for you. We have to be willing to accept that and acknowledge that in our life. And it's not always easy, but take a hard look at what God could do with your life because of where you are right now and what your situation is. God can accomplish something with you now that he might not could have been accomplishing otherwise. These are things we have to think about sometimes to understand God and life and plans and all the rest effectively. God's purposes are so very important. While we stand and sing, I'd invite you to come to be baptized or restored to the Lord. Let's be singing together at this time. Right.